start with a uh, pan, and this pan is unbelievable. It's super heavy. And oh, but first I got some messages asking me what this was. So this is a Christopher Nolan signed production script of The Dark Knight. I have the script for Roma. I love this one because it has a cover. And also the script is in both English and if you turn it over this way and open it, it's in Spanish. I just love that. You ever see this movie? For those of you who don't know, it's very graduate-esque. Cat Stevens does the music instead of Simon and Garfunkel, but it has that very similar feel. Both are like dark comedies, coming-of-age films. Both involve relationships with older women. The dark comedy of Harold and Maude is hysterical. I have here, Harold, the form sent out by the National Computer Dating Service. They screen out the fat and the ugly, so it is obviously a firm to my standards. The character of Harold is a very disturbed young boy who's basically been sheltered by his controlling mother his entire life. And so his way of acting out is by committing these faux suicides <laughs> that are hilarious. Every time his mother brings in a new girl to like, so he can get married to her basically, he kills himself in some ridiculous way. <laughs> And then he forms a bond with this older woman he just happens to meet while he's peeking at one of the funerals he goes to all the time. And they form a very interesting relationship. Tell me, do you dance? Pardon me? Do you sing and dance? Uh, no. Uh, no. I thought not. <laughs> I can't help but compare this film to The Graduate all the time. Even the scene with the scuba suit in The Graduate is similar to this pool scene in Harold and Maude. The thing is with The Graduate, they present the main character's relationship with Mrs. Robinson as kind of a joke. She's just like a cougar. And as an audience member, you don't really see this relationship working out long term. Do you think we could say a few words to each other first this time? I don't think we have much to say to each other. Whereas Maud in Harold and Maud is far more fleshed out and likable. She's actually way more fun than Harold. <laughs> She does not conform to the rules of society at all. Harold has this obsession with death, and that's because life for him is so mundane and awful because of his god-awful mother. Oh, one thing more, Harold. I telephoned your second computer date this morning, and she seems a very nice, quiet girl. Even though their relationship gets romantic, Maud also kind of acts as a maternal figure in a weird way. She gives him life advice. More importantly, she accepts Harold for who he is, unlike all these other people in Harold's life who are trying to control him. This film isn't shot or lit like a comedy at all. It has a very indie feel. The film definitely has a lower budget, but I love the cinematography of this film. I think it looks great. The opening shot is one of the highlights as we see Harold set up his first on-screen fake suicide. The book that comes with the Blu-ray elaborates on this a little more. That scene earlier with Harold in the pool, that wasn't a dummy or anything. There was no like oxygen pouch or anything. That was just court. There's a lot of other stuff we can get into, such as Harold's uh, uncle. Kill for Joe and Mac and all the rest of the guys. Kill. But I think I'll just leave Harold and Maude right there. Great movie. I highly recommend you check it out. So this is like my Criterion section. Recently, Criterion had a sale at like Barnes and Noble. You could get them half off. And some of these I haven't seen. This one, Sallow, which I hear is amazing. So maybe next time, uh, definitely before the next Blu-ray collection video, I'll see Sallow and I'll let you all know what I think. This is my favorite Sardonicast recommended movie that I didn't pick. Um, Fantastic Planet. I've learned since that it's like a like, Jack Black loves the film, apparently. A lot of R&B artists, like, take samples from the score, which I think is one of the best scores of all time. The film takes place in, like, a post-apocalyptic future in which the humans have been conquered by these giant blue aliens, and they basically keep us around as pets. And the film is so bizarre. 
Because it takes place in an alien world, you're not supposed to be able to fathom anything that's going on. It would be the equivalent of, like, a dog. <laughs> What's up, fat ass? How are you doing, buddy? Oh, my pal. It would be the equivalent of, like, a dog, like, trying to fathom me making this video. The Blu-ray comes with a few short films as well. Whoa, dude. That strong animation is really what makes this film work. The designs of the worlds feel truly alien, even though the story is pretty dark and adult. Make no mistake, this is an adult animated film. The world is just so endlessly fascinating to explore. We were somewhere around Barstow, on the edge of the desert, when the drugs began to take hold. I watched it again recently after Once Upon a Time in Hollywood because that movie actually kind of reminded me of this. This is probably the best movie to capture what it's like to be on drugs and be in Las Vegas. I was right in the middle of a fucking reptile zoo and somebody was giving booze to these goddamn things. It won't be long now before they tear us to shreds. The opening quote of this film is very telling. It's about drowning the sorrows of life in tons of drugs and alcohol. And that's ultimately what Las Vegas is, isn't it? Yeah. And this film captures that so well. It has a great cast of people who play very minor roles. Toby Maguire is in the film, Gary Busey, Gary Busey, Gary Busey, Gary Busey, Gary Busey, Christina Busey's in the movie, Henry Dean Busey. Penn Jillette makes a cameo at some point. Step up to this fantastic machine, just 99 cents. Your likeness will appear 200 feet tall. Benicio Del Toro is great in this movie. Truth hurts. That's ah. Yeah. Ah. That's ah. Mm. Ah. Ah. That's ah. I like the other one, the Rum Diaries also. It's not nearly as good as this, of course not. You know what else has um, Hunter S. Thompson in it? This fucking movie right here. Oh, there's another one. I knew it. When fucking Hunter S. Thompson showed up in the movie, I was like, what the fuck? I don't know why that's in the movie, but it's great. Ringo also has a scene that is very similar to a scene in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. They're both like chase scenes in the desert. They're both playing Flight of the Valkyrie. <laughs> That's fucking machine gun, man. They're firing at us. Machine gun. Get that war zone, man. Get us out of here quick. I'm gonna give you three names. Ready? Roger Deakins as cinematography consultant. It's probably why this movie looks badass. Gore Verbinski as director. Gore Verbinski made Pirates of the Caribbean. He made Cure for Wellness, which looked great, but it sucked. And now he gives us Rango. And then finally, you got Hans Zimmer banging out another phenomenal score. Unlike a lot of animated films, which are very clean and, and colorful, Rango is very dark and dirty. There's like death and violence in it. There's real stakes to the story. It's basically Chinatown for kids. He filmed the movie like live action with the actors performing it. And then the CGI artists like kind of overlaid animation on top of it. You have all these very talented actors and you're not just throwing them in a sound booth in a studio. Like Johnny Depp is a very charismatic actor. He uses his whole body and, and moves and it's part of his appeal. And he incorporates that into this film really well. And the character of Rango actually ends up having a lot of really funny ticks. Great movie. And you can also win a 2011 Ford Escape Hybrid. I gotta take him up on that offer. Now you know you're watching some classic cinema when it starts with an overture. These are people who didn't even, they didn't have computers. They were editing film on these fucking machines and they had to cut and splice and tape them. And they somehow managed to make these amazing scenes. I own this from, from 1976, which is starring Jessica Lange. This one sucks. There's a guy in a, a suit that looks so stupid. 
And then instead of the Empire State Building, he fights on top of the World Trade Center. You know, that didn't age well, did it? Fucking morons. King Kong is an awesome movie. A director named Carl Denham is trying to get a film made on an infamous location known as Skull Island. He's searching for a beautiful young woman to be the star of this film. Scram! And he stumbles across Anne Darrow. Hey! Taxi! But these characters are very entertaining to watch. I like how much time is dedicated to before we see King Kong in the film. There's a lot of build up to him, but we also get a lot of time to explore these characters. The stop motion effects are very inspired and entertaining to watch. The compositing in some shots is extremely impressive for a film in 1933. The miniatures and the incorporation of rear screen projection with practical sets is really cool. You hear like the screams just abruptly stop. Here's my copy of Breathless. It's one of my favorite Criterion design Blu-rays though. I love the book it comes with. Great movie. So there's this director I never really mentioned, uh, which I, I feel like I should start mentioning at this point. It's been 40 years since surrealist auteur David Lynch unleashed a racer head upon audiences. Informed by the director's experiences living with his wife in Philadelphia, Eraserhead is set in an underpopulated wasteland, rendered through an industrial soundtrack. David Lynch is a very interesting man. He acts in a lot of his own work. He has like a musical career with his composer. He made this film of him just cooking quinoa. We're cooking quinoa. It's one of the most riveting things I've ever seen. This is by far his best work. Moths were flipping and flying and like frogs. Frog moths were pulling themselves out of the earth and flying up in front of the stand. Dust was blowing. It was like a, a, a mysterious, strange wind sound. Before he was a filmmaker, he studied to become a painter in the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. For Lynch's small town sensibilities, Philadelphia's rundown post industrial neighborhoods were quite jarring. Lynch's paintings were dark, and only got darker as time went on. Eventually, he wondered if paintings could move. Lynch experimented with different soundscapes to give the whole piece an ethereal feel, very much inspired by that post-industrial landscape of Philadelphia, where he had lived for so many years. He based this nightmarish hellscape Eraserhead is set in on Callow Hill, a neighborhood in Philly. The neighborhood has been nicknamed Eraserhood. The production was an unpleasant and rather painstaking process for everyone, especially for the star of the movie, Jack Nance, who was forced to keep this fucking haircut for the entire shoot. The Eye of the Duck scene is a staple of David Lynch's work. When Lynch was asked to describe the purpose of the scene in an interview, he said, if you study a duck, you'll see certain things. The bill is a certain texture and a certain length. The head is a certain shape. The key to the whole duck is the eye and where it's placed. It's like a little jewel. When you're working on a film, a lot of times you get the bill and the legs and the body and everything. But this eye of the duck is a certain scene, this jewel, that if it's there, it's absolutely beautiful. The scene serves as kind of the emotional focal point of the film in terms of character development and theme. In all of Lynch's work, there is a certain scene, or a moment, which is vital to the emotional journey of the characters, and brings a certain symmetry to the story. The scene is also stylistically different than the rest of the film, and has little to no bearing on the plot. Lynch believes that every film has an eye of the duck scene, not just his own. Lynch has never said what this scene is in Eraserhead. It can be assumed that in Eraserhead, the introduction of the lady in the ra radiator is the eye of the duck scene. I get that this whole movie is quite dreamlike, so it may be difficult to discern. The scene doesn't have much bearing on the plot. She also doesn't interact with any other character aside from Henry. That isn't to say that the scene or this character are unimportant, because it might actually be the most important part of the whole movie. Whether this woman is in his head or dream or real, it doesn't really matter the logic behind it. 
The scene just shows us how desperately Henry wishes to escape the pressures of being a father. It's a combining of theater and real life, and there's no distinct difference between the two anymore. Following the LA premiere in March of 1977, Eraserhead was met with mixed reviews, of course, because this shit is insane. And then in comes a man named Ben Barinholtz. He's known as the father of the midnight movie. He is known for his innovations distributing and screening films and for discovering first-time directors such as Guy Madden, George Romero. He worked with the Coens on Raising Arizona, Blood Simple, Barton Fink. He also played a zombie in Dawn of the Dead, George Romero's version, not the Zack Snyder one. Baron Holtz screened Eraserhead and after only seeing half of it, decided to buy it. David Lynch lived in Baron Holtz's apartment for a little bit, and there were posters of Eraserhead printed on the wall. Baron Holtz was keen on keeping it running in at least one American theater. His faith in the movie soon paid off as word of mouth transformed it into an overnight success. The vision to have lines around the block eventually became a reality. Eraserhead wasn't just a great movie, it was a game changer. <laughs> 